Schönen guten Morgen, grüß euch. Ähm, ich bin Thorsten Hübschen von Microsoft. Ich freue mich sehr, dass ich jetzt euch Kate Mildner vorstellen kann. Wir hatten gestern Morgen ja die Panel-Diskussion zum, zum Thema neues Arbeiten gehabt. Da haben wir recht theoretisch noch drüber gesprochen. Ähm, wie sieht es denn aus hier in Deutschland? Wie können wir neue Arbeitsformen machen? Und ich freue mich sehr, dass Kate von, von Microsoft Research jetzt da ist und mal ganz konkret über eine ziemlich banale, fast alltägliche Sache reden kann, nämlich wie, wie sieht es eigentlich mit den Handys aus? Ähm, ist es echt unhöflich, wenn man Handys nimmt in zwischenmenschlichen Beziehungen, also wenn man im Café sitzt und alle schreiben Handys? Oder wie fügt sich das eigentlich in die ähm, Lebens- und Arbeitswelt ein? Um, Kate, welcome to be here. Um, happy to have you here. Um, you're an experienced, you're a very experienced speaker in Republika, first time. <laughs> no, second time here. Please come here. Kate, welcome to, to the stage. And Thank you very much. I have my yeah. Okay, thanks. Hey, hello everyone. My name is Kate Miltner, as Thurston just said, and I work at Microsoft Research New England in Boston. How are you all doing? You having a good time on this Thursday morning? Awesome. Well, I don't know about you, but I've been having a great time at the conference so far. This is actually my second time at Republica, and the overarching theme of my two sessions this year is mobile phones. Last night, I ran an experimental emoji karaoke session that involved audience participation, group sing-alongs, and beer, uh, but this morning will be slightly different. Over the next 20 minutes, I'm going to talk about the ways in which our mobile phone habits, or since we are in Germany, should I say our handy habits, uh, impact our interpersonal relationships. I rather think this is quite a timely subject, given that on Wednesday there was a crafting station outside that allowed you to make your own mobile phone blocking bag, which is uh, where that picture is from. And hopefully this talk will convince you that those are not entirely necessary. Okay, the clicker doesn't work. So just as a bit of housekeeping, uh, please tweet your comments using the hashtag PhonePublica as well as RP14. And this talk is also part of Microsoft's Einfachmachen discussion, so feel free to use that hashtag as well. So this presentation is based upon a study that was a collaborative project. My two co-authors were Dr. Jeffrey Hall, an associate professor in the communications department at the University of Kansas, and my colleague, Dr. Nancy Baim, a principal researcher at Microsoft Research New England. This project has its origins in the concerns about the impact of mobile phones in our most important relationships, specifically that they are responsible for the fact that we are disconnected and that our relationships are deteriorating as a result. My co-author, Dr. Baim, is an expert in interpersonal communication and technology. Um, sorry, that's really embarrassing. Can, can you just hold on a second? Hello? No, no, it's totally fine. I know it's so hard to get a minute alone these days. Yeah, oh, hold on, guys, here you go. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Hello? Pedro? It's inconsiderate cell phone man. You're at the concert? Thanks for the invite, Glenn. You tell her I'm tan all over. So inappropriate. I'll tell you what, from here, she looks pretty cute. It's supposed to be ready on Tuesday. Ah! Oh, well, happy birthday to you, Nana. Yeah, there's a picture of it right here. Unsavory. It's inconsistent. <laughs> Marty, you're a joker. Right, so, rules about mobile phone behavior. Whether they are explicitly posted or not, everybody has their own ideas about what is and is not appropriate. Shockingly, even Americans. The video I just showed you actually was an advertisement that would play in movie theaters in the early 2000s in the US to remind people in an entertaining way that they needed to turn off their phones or at least put them on silent and refrain from talking loudly during the movie. 
While the ad is intentionally absurd, because the point is to be funny, it very clearly illustrates that there are certain social guidelines regarding what behavior is considered to be acceptable or unacceptable in certain contexts. In social science research, we refer to these guidelines as injunctive norms. Injunctive norms are social rules that guide behavior. They are not absolute standards, and they often change over time. Furthermore, these norms often vary depending on your age, gender, location, culture, and social group. However, no matter how old you are or where you're from, if you violate a widely accepted norm, you are going to be judged by the other people around you. Injunctive norm violations are often the source of culture clash or tension between different generations. Here's a good example. In the United Kingdom, where I lived for a few years, it's not customary to tip more than 10% if you tip anything at all. In the US, if you tip less than 20%, your server will be incredibly offended and angry, and you probably should not plan on going back to that restaurant. When it comes to technology, and particularly personal technologies, there are a lot of norms that govern how they're used, particularly in public places. For example, there are expectations that you shouldn't play music without headphones on public transportation, or that you shouldn't use flash photography, particularly in a museum or during a theater production. The no flash photography rule is so widespread that it's actually become somewhat of a meme. When it comes to mobile phones, there are a lot of social norms, although they can vary depending on what country or what even city you live in. But generally speaking, there are a few commonly held rules when it comes to proper mobile phone etiquette. One is, you shouldn't talk loudly about personal issues in public. You shouldn't use your phone at the dinner table. You shouldn't use your phone when you're with someone else or when you should be paying attention to something else, like a really, really interesting keynote conference, for example. So as I mentioned at the start of this talk, before we, so, we were so rudely interrupted by my fake phone call, this project came into being after my co-author, Dr. Baim, was laughed at on a radio show for suggesting that our relationships were not, in fact, being ruined by our bad mobile phone behavior. However, perhaps it's not so surprising that her position was met with such disbelief given that the press frequently tells us in no uncertain terms that our phones are condemning us to a life of ruined relationships. These articles make dire proclamations that if you text at the dinner table, talk loudly in public, text when you're with other people, or violate any of the other injunctive norms that have been mentioned in this presentation, you will alienate your loved ones and end up alone. Now, I'm a big fan of audience participation, so I'm going to take a minute to ask you all a few questions. Is that okay? All right, well, I'm going to do it anyway. So, how many of you think it's wrong to use your phone when you're with other people? Raise your hands. Not that many, okay. How about texting at the table? All right. Talking loudly in public? Ah, okay. There we go. So, how many of you have actually done those things? And I promise not to judge you because I was at a restaurant. Oh, there we go. Okay. There we go. Okay, so how many of you have ever had a friend or a partner end their relationship with you because you violated those rules? Excellent. My point exactly. So, both from personal experience and because she is a critical media scholar, Dr. Baim was pretty sure that this whole phones ruining relationships thing was a little off. She hypothesized that mobile phones only caused relationship issues if you and your partner had different attitudes or norms regarding mobile phone use. So we decided to see if she was right. To do this, I collected a list of common rules concerning mobile phone behavior, and then we surveyed 69 university students, either friends or romantic partners, about four things. How much they agreed with each rule and how important it was to follow that rule, how often they themselves followed those rules, how often their friend or romantic partner followed those rules, and the quality of that particular relationship. 
Uh, to measure the quality of the pair's relationship, we looked at three traditional indicators of relationship quality, which are commitment, liking, and satisfaction. We also had a hunch that the social context, or where these rules were either followed or ignored, was also important. So we asked the study participants to imagine three different contexts when they answered each question, illustrated here by the minions from Despicable Me. One, together with the other half of their survey pair in a very public setting or with a group of people. Together with that person in public, but in a more intimate setting, like a table for two in a restaurant or alone with the other half of their survey pair in private. So what happened? Well, it turns out that Dr. Bain was right. Whether or not we follow societal norms for mobile phone use does not have an impact on the quality of our personal relationships. Isn't that a relief? However, the key word here is societal norms. What everyone else thinks is not the issue here. What is the issue is what we call internalized norms. These are our own internal standards for behavior, our own personal set of normative beliefs. And it turns out that these are important, particularly when it comes to how our relationships function. The old adage and catchy Paula Abdul song states that opposites attract. However, when it comes to satisfying relationships, the perception that you are similar to your partner is actually very important. Now, whether you are actually similar to them is another story, but if you think that you are similar to your partner, then you are more likely to like them more, feel more satisfied in the relationship, and consequently feel more committed to them. So in our study, the role of perceived similarity was key. In the public one-on-one -on -one context, like at a cafe table, you were less likely to believe that mobile phones were an issue in your relationship if you believed that you and your partner shared the same rules and if you believed that your partner followed those rules. In the private one-on-one -on -one context, when people were totally alone together, People liked their partners more and felt more committed to them when they felt like they shared the same ideas about appropriate mobile phone behavior. Okay, so what about fully public situations? Well, this is where people felt that it was most important to obey the rules, so to speak. However, these were personal rules or internalized norms and not the societal or injunctive norms. The more that people believed their partners followed their rules in public, the more they liked them, and the fewer concerns they had about the impact of mobile phones in their relationship. In a somewhat funny discovery, it turns out that the participants' own behavior, not just their partners, impacted how they felt about the relationship. When participants themselves thought that they followed their own rules, they liked their partners more and felt more committed to them. And we're not exactly sure why this is. But this is actually good news for relationships, because we also discovered, perhaps not surprisingly, that we all think that we are better at following the rules than everybody else. So aside from the fact that we think that we're great at following the rules, what can we learn from this study on a larger scale? First, it's important to understand that what is happening in the media with mobile phones is not a one-off occurrence. Connected to the issues of norms and new technology are the phenomenon of media panics. A media panic is a public discourse that involves a heightened criticism about a new medium or technology. It tends to involve all sorts of dire proclamations, and it usually tends to act as a focal point for some deeper underlying concern, often related to larger social issues or changes. Media panics are as old as the hills. One of the earliest media panics can be found in Plato's Phaedrus, where Socrates warned against the dangers of writing, arguing that it would make people ignorant and hard to get along with. New technologies have always caused panics. In the past 100 years, we've had panics about the radio, television, and the internet, among many other things. These panics touch on a wide variety of issues, but the one common thread, or at least one of the common threads, 
is the fear that these technologies are altering or diminishing the authenticity of human connection. Even Socrates was concerned with these issues of authenticity versus superficiality. He was worried that writing would make it harder to have exchanges of true wisdom, otherwise known as good conversations. Sound familiar? Many brilliant people have written at length about media and or technology panics, uh, but I find that this rather funny comic from XKCD sums it up quite nicely. And as you can see from the red arrows on the right, mobile phones are checking quite a few of those boxes. If we look at the many articles that breathlessly address these issues, connectivity, or the lack thereof, is at their core. My iPhone is ruining my marriage. That woman in the photo is prioritizing her phone over her baby. Well, that's a whole other talk, but I think you get the picture. But you may be saying, what about all of those people on the street who are immersed in their phones? Sure, those people exist. But according to a recent study by Professor Keith Hampton of Rutgers University in New Jersey, the people on their phones are usually alone, not with other people or in groups. And even if those people are on their phones, they usually only make up 3 to 10% of the people in a particular public space. It turns out that we just see them because people spend more time in public spaces than they used to do. Okay, you may be saying, but what about all of those people on trains and other forms of public transport? Everyone is on their phone, right? Well, I hate to break it to you, but it's not like people were engaged in deep conversation on public transport before the advent of mobile phones. As mobile phones and what we can do with them change, norms for appropriate behavior, both in and out of relationships, will be negotiated and renegotiated over and over again. The rules that we have for mobile phones now are not likely going to be the rules that we have in the future. And they certainly, were, cer excuse me, certainly weren't the rules that we had when mobile phones first came on the scene. Finding a phone in a car isn't that unusual anymore, except when it leaves the car for greener pastures, the high seas, or a leisurely lunch. Radio Shack keeps you in constant communication with their affordable, transportable cellular telephone. Hello? Oh, yes, he's right here. It's for you. Yes? I heard about the merger. Buy 100 shares. The affordable, transportable cellular telephone. Only at Radio Shack. I love the 90s. Okay, so as you can see in the hilarious advertisement that we just watched, Many of the selling points of the car phone that leaves the car are things that are now considered to be common norm violations. Talking on the golf course, at dinner, on vacation, and when you are supposed to be spending time with your family. So what this study shows is that there are not simple answers to questions of how mobile phones and their use impact relationships. First, what mobile phone behavior means in any given relationship depends on many things. Every relationship is different, so there isn't going to be one set of rules that broadly applies to everybody. Secondly, it's important to remember that mobile phone use is only one factor of many when it comes to how well a relationship works. Furthermore, the problems that are purportedly caused by phones are often communication problems in disguise. If your partner is upset, that you are texting at the dinner table. It is most likely that the real issue is that he or she is upset that you aren't paying attention to them. Replace the phone with a television, a computer, or even a book, and you have the same exact issue. Understanding how mobile phones truly impact relationships starts by rejecting the idea that there is only one standard for behavior, and that failing to adhere to that standard has the same impact on everyone. If we are going to truly understand the interaction between phones and relationships, we need to see mobile phone use as simply part of a complex puzzle whose pieces are different for everyone and constantly changing over time. 
So if you're annoyed by the way your friend or romantic partner is using their mobile phone, the best course of action is just to talk to them about it and figure out where your expectations might be similar or different. But just in case, you might want to do that face to face. Thank you very much.